Hello and welcome to this Step Up to Chem HE video workshop, the first workshop that we've done on physical chemistry. Exciting. Um, so step up the Step Up to Chem HE initiative, as you may well know by now, is a series of video workshops and associated resources designed to help the transition of foundation year and first year Bradford students into chemistry focus modules, people who maybe don't have a strong previous background in the subject. You'll need between 20 and 30 minutes to complete this video workshop properly. There are a number of quick practice questions throughout. At these points, you should pause the workshop and work through the questions at your own pace. To get the most out of the session, you'll need something to write or draw with and a basic calculator. So nothing fancy, the calculator app on your mobile phone is absolutely fine. So here's what we're going to cover in the session. We'll first define the term thermodynamics and how it relates to the chemical sciences discipline, followed by some of the most common terms that you'll hear when people talk about thermodynamics, including three absolutely key parameters, enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy. We'll look at predicting the properties of chemical reactions when certain thermodynamic information is given. I'll introduce this idea of a reaction coordinate and we'll learn about what they show and the important features of them. We'll talk briefly about a rule that we call Hess's law and how to use it in basic terms. And key to actually answering questions and passing assessments on this topic, we'll look at how you can rationalize that certain chemical reactions are a, uh, exothermic or endothermic, B, entropically favorable or entropically unfavorable, and C, exergonic or endergonic. Now, understanding energy in chemistry is absolutely key to understanding how the world and how life itself actually works. In chemistry, the behavior of all molecules, atoms, and even electrons can be traced back to energy. And this is because, as I've said before in previous videos, chemicals should be considered as essentially lazy. And because they're lazy, they're constantly trying to exist in the lowest energy state possible. So always remember that. That's what all matter tries to tend towards, the lowest possible energy state. A term that you're going to frequently encounter when talking about energy in chemistry is the term thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is simply the area of science that deals with heat and its relationship to other forms of energy. You'll remember from your previous education, one of the things we're taught, of course, is that there are many different forms of energy. In chemistry, the heat that we're discussing is the heat transferred in chemical or physical changes. So this could be something melting, something evaporating, something burning, or something happening in nature, such as uh, respiration or oxygenation of blood, for example. Now you may have heard that there are four fundamental laws of thermodynamics. I actually don't think it's necessary to go into all of these to understand the subject properly with respect to chemistry. So we'll just cover the aspects of them that we need to. Rather, we'll start by looking at energy and chemical reactions. So there are three specific terms for energy involved in chemical reactions. Enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy. So looking at each one in turn, starting with the first one. Enthalpy is sometimes inaccurately just called heat energy. So more, more precisely, enthalpy is internal energy. What's meant by this is the energy consumed or released by the forming and breaking of chemical bonds. Now for a bond to break, the chemical in question needs to take in energy from its surroundings. And for a bond to form, the chemicals release energy to their surroundings. Now, an interesting point about enthalpy is that it isn't actually possible to measure directly the enthalpy of a substance. So very rarely will you see just the symbol H used on its own. 
Rather, we measure an enthalpy change as a chemical converts to another species. And the term for this is delta H, change in enthalpy. So this uh, triangle here, that's a capital delta, which is a Greek alphabet letter. The units of delta H are joules per mole, although kilojoules per mole is much more commonly seen because of the general magnitude of uh, delta H values. You can calculate the enthalpy change of a chemical reaction with this equation here. So delta H is equal to uh, enthalpy of products of the chemical reaction minus enthalpy of reactants. However, because as I said, you can't directly calculate enthalpy values. This equation is actually rarely used in practice, so it's rarely one that you have to remember. It is, however, very important to understand what the words exothermic and endothermic mean. So an exothermic reaction is one where the enthalpy of reactants is greater than that of the products. For an endothermic reaction, exactly the reverse is true. This is often best expressed by a pair of diagrams like these two here. So for both of these diagrams on the x-axis, we've got reaction coordinate. And this just means the progress of a chemical reaction. That's all it means. On the y-axis is the energy of the chemicals involved. Now, note in this case how both reactions, the exothermic and the endothermic one, require some activation energy to be inputted before anything will happen. Just because a reaction is exothermic does not mean it is spontaneous and will just go off without somebody doing something to increase the energy of the chemicals. Uh, in exothermic reactions, the associated delta H value is always negative. So the internal energy of the product is lower than that of the reactant. Therefore, the chemical reaction must have lost internal energy. In endothermic reactions, as I hope you can see from the diagrams, the reverse is true. It's also worth at this point identifying a couple of other features that you might commonly see on reaction coordinates. Now, the species that you get here and here at the kind of energy peaks, um, those species are called transition states. Now, transition states cannot be detected by normal chemical analysis. And in fact, a lot of the time, they're purely theoretical. We can't actually prove that they exist. All they are is some kind of combination of reactant and product that is so high energy and so unstable that it can't exist for a measurable period of time. It must immediately either convert back to reactants or progress to being products. Now, this guy here, uh, in a little short step on its own, is called an intermediate. Now this too is a step somewhere in between reactant and product, but unlike the transition state, we can define and we can show what the intermediate looks like. And we can prove that it exists through chemical analysis because it lasts at least long enough to be detectable. In fact, some intermediates can last for several days. Some are very long lived. And the other thing to note is the way that many chemical and biological catalysts work is by lowering the overall activation energy needed for a reaction to occur by the creation of new lower energy transition states and intermediates. So that's, I've tried to express that here on the reaction coordinate in this um, uncatalyzed and catalyzed reaction pathway. So catalysis is an important term in uh, chemistry and biochemistry, but not the subject of this video. So here are just some quick quiz questions on the subject of enthalpy. Pause the video here and have a go at them. It won't take you very long. And when you think you've arrived at an answer for each of them, you can reveal the, you can unpause the video and reveal the answers on the next slide.
So here are the answers. So just take a moment to ensure that you got them all right. And if you didn't get one right, understand why you didn't get it right before you move on. One further key idea to introduce before we move on from enthalpy is Hess's law. Now, what this states is that in a given chemical reaction, the total enthalpy change is the sum of all the enthalpy changes of the different steps. It follows from this that the total enthalpy change is independent of the route that we take to make the chemical reaction work, to go from, to go from the reactants of interest to the products of interest. So this sounds uh, fairly theoretical, so let's illustrate it with a, a biology-based example. So the, the Krebs cycle, seen in the diagram here, which as you'll probably know is part of ATP production in biology. If we look at the conversion step between citrate and isocitrate at the top here. Now what Hess's law tells us is that it doesn't matter if we were to directly convert isocitrate back into normal citrate. It doesn't matter if we do that or if we were to follow the entire Krebs cycle round through all the different molecules, chemicals and enzymes, all the way round to get to citrate via this route, the overall enthalpy change between isocitrate and citrate would be the same, regardless of whether you took the short route or the very, very long route. And this is actually extremely useful because considering a much simplified system like this one here, what it means is that you can work out the enthalpy change associated with any step of a reaction cycle as long as you know the enthalpy changes associated with all the other steps. So what's happening here is that chemical A can turn into chemical D either directly or by converting it first into chemical B, then chemical C, and then finally chemical C to D. And the enthalpy changes of the two processes, as per the previous slide, are overall the same, which I've tried to show in this uh, equation here. So if these values are known, we might not be able to measure the enthalpy change associated with A turning into D directly, but we can do it indirectly. So let's do that now. Let's calculate the enthalpy change of chemical A turning into chemical D using the Hess's law cycle approach, right? So pause the video now, go through the simple calculation and um, resume when you've got an answer. Okay, so this is the correct answer. So just take a moment to check whether you got it right. And if you didn't, understand what went wrong in your calculation. Right, let's move on to talking about the second key thermodynamic uh, parameter. Entropy, S, is defined as the degree of disorder in the reactants or the products of a reaction. Similarly to enthalpy, it's more common to see a delta S value rather than an S value. Both terms, however, regardless of whether it's S or delta S, have these units of joules per Kelvin per mole. Right, the units are different to enthalpy because entropy is what we call temperature dependent, right? So if you take a glass of water and uh, go into a lab and heat it up with a Bunsen burner, of course the water starts to boil. And this is because you're increasing the entropy of the system. You're giving the water molecules more energy so that they move faster, uh, bump into each other more frequently, and eventually they get enough energy to escape the beaker and uh, evaporate, become gas molecules. Whereas enthalpy is not temperature dependent, so chemical bonds break and form with exactly the same energy changes, regardless of what the temperature is. It's just that the bonds may be broken at a faster or slower rate according to the temperature. Oh, and a final point, entropy changes are generally of a much uh, 
the, the values associated with them are generally much smaller than enthalpy changes. And that's kind of a, a little tip that you can carry forward to um, assessment situations. If you've, if you've done uh, an entropy calculation based on enthalpy data, and the value that comes out at the end of your calculation is, uh, you know, in the in the thousands of joules per Kelvin per mole, so bigger than the enthalpy values associated, you've probably done something wrong. Entropy values are generally at least one order of magnitude lower than enthalpy values. There are a few important rules we need to remember about entropy changes. The first is this, that liquids have a higher entropy than solids and gases have a much, much higher entropy even than liquids. And it makes sense when you think about it. So in solid materials, the atoms, molecules or ions are packed very tightly together, often in uh, ordered repeating arrangements. So the degree of order in that system therefore is high. In liquids, the um, the atoms, molecules or ions can move around each other. So that creates much more disorder. And in gases, of course, they can fly about all over the place. So that creates much, much more disorder. So when considering chemical reactions, we need to look at the number of moles of gas that are present on, on each side of a chemical equation. For example, in the reaction of hydrogen gas and nitrogen gas to form ammonia, which is also a gas, pause the video now and think how you would work out or attempt to work out whether this reaction would have a positive or a negative entropy change and resume when you're finished. Okay, so the first thing we have to do with any problem of this nature is look at the equation and see if it needs balancing because hopefully you should have spotted that the two sides of this equation are not balanced. So that's the first thing to address. Right, so we've got two nitrogen atoms on the left as it stands, but only one on the right. So let's go ahead and put a two in front of our uh, ammonia. So nitrogens are now balanced, but now we've got six hydrogen atoms on the right, two times three. So we now need to put a three in front of the H2 gas on our left, which now gives six hydrogen atoms, three times two equals six, right? So that is now balanced. That's the first step done. Now, as as you'll see from the the state symbols, Every species in this reaction is, is in fact a gas. So now from that, we can see that there are four moles in gas, uh, four moles of gas in total on the left hand side, but only two on the right hand side. So from that, it's quite simple. We would predict a decrease in entropy, so a negative entropy value. The second thing to remember with regard to entropy is that when the number of moles of gas on both sides of the equation are equal, you then need to look at the total number of moles of all chemical species present on either side of the equation. The more individual chemical species present, the higher the entropy is. You can think of this as almost a school playground scenario. If you were to put one naughty child into a playground, like in the example on the left, they can run around and scream, but they can't do that much damage on their own. If you put a lot more naughty children into the playground, they can bump into each other, fall over, start fights, etc. So there's much more chaos and disorder caused. So having said that, let's look at the classic example of photosynthesis, the equation, of course, by which plants create their food. Right, have a look at this uh, equation. It's it's balanced for you this time. And work out whether you think the entropy change is going to be positive or negative. Okay, so again, pause, try and come to an answer and uh, resume when you're ready. Right, so hopefully you saw that in this example, the 
the number of moles of gas on each side are actually equal. So we've got six carbon dioxides on the left and six oxygens on the right. So that in itself doesn't help us. However, on the left, we have 12 moles of the different species in total. So six carbon dioxides, six waters. And on the right, we have only seven, not six oxygens, but only one molecule of glucose because it's a big molecule. So overall, therefore, based on that, the entropy change that we predict is negative. Final thing to bear in mind is that in isolation, a larger chemical species has more entropy than a smaller one. So they have more bonds, more movement within the molecule, different bits of the molecule bumping into each other and interacting with each other. There's, there's a lot going on in a big molecule. So for example, a protein has a lot more entropy than an amino acid. However, when considering the chemical reaction overall, what tends to happen is that this factor is normally overruled by the other two factors we mentioned. The last thermodynamic term we'll look at is Gibbs free energy, or G. It's important to understand that Gibbs energy is not describing another completely independent form of energy in chemical reactions. Rather, it is the combined effects of enthalpy and entropy and temperature. We can define it as the total amount of usable energy given off or taken in by a chemical reaction when temperature and pressure are held constant. As such, same as for enthalpy and entropy, we tend to talk about a change in Gibbs free energy for a reaction rather than just the free energy itself. And the units for delta G are the same as for delta H and the same descriptions apply. Now, the relationships between changes in enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs are shown in this equation here. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Now, whether delta G is negative or positive is extremely important in chemistry because that tells us whether the reaction will be spontaneous or not. In other words, if we just mix the chemicals together will they react on their own and form what we want them to form or will we need to do something to force the reaction to go through so negative delta g means the reaction is spontaneous positive delta g means the reaction is not spontaneous of course delta h and delta s are intrinsic properties of the chemical reaction yeah they are what they are we we cannot do anything to change them so then, as you may have worked out, the only term in the equation that we can possibly control is the temperature. And this is why temperature control, both in nature and in the chemical industry, is absolutely critical. Let me give you an example. Consider a certain chemical reaction that we want to make happen. It doesn't matter what the exact nature of the reaction is. But we're saying it has a positive enthalpy change of 10 kilojoules per mole and a positive entropy change of 20 joules per kelvin per mole. Now, of course, the first thing to do to have this problem make any sense is to convert the delta H term into joules per mole so that it becomes 10,000 rather than 10. When using this equation, as with many, many others in physical chemistry, the use of units across all the terms has to be the same. Okay, your terms have to be in SI units. Now, hopefully, looking at these terms in the equation, you can see that when the temperature is low, this reaction isn't going to work. Let's say we try the reaction at zero degrees Celsius, which hopefully you should know is 273 Kelvin. So you must use temperature in Kelvin in this equation again, otherwise it doesn't work. The maths then becomes 10,000 minus 273 times 20 in brackets, and that comes out as plus 4,540 joules per mole. But hopefully you can see that once the T delta S term becomes big enough, so this term here, then the reaction will become spontaneous because as temperature increases, Delta G will decrease and decrease until it eventually becomes negative. So 
For example, if we tried the reaction at 500 degrees C, which is 773 Kelvin, this is what happens. It, it becomes 10,000 divided by 773, uh, uh, sorry, 10,000 minus 773 times 20, and that comes out as minus 5460 kil, uh, joules per mole. So the reaction has now become spontaneous. And this is why we have to build massive furnaces and reactors to accommodate the chemical reactions that we want to make use of. And it's also, on a biological basis, one of the main reasons for homeostasis. So the chemical reactions that go on inside the body to keep us alive proceed at a certain rate, at a certain temperature. If the core body temperature changes, the biochemical reactions stop working the way they should. Now, not all reactions are the same, of course. Some reactions will be spontaneous regardless of temperature, and some can never be made to be spontaneous. The relationships between the three thermodynamic parameters and the types of reaction are seen in this table. Now, you may well have to memorize this information for assessment purposes. Although when you think about it, if you can recall how the equation works in the slide that we've just had, in the example we've just gone through, you don't actually need to memorize the table. But this is up to you to work out the best way of learning something for yourself. Two final important terms to define are exergonic and endergonic. And these are simply dependent on whether the delta G term is positive or negative. The negative delta G is an exergonic reaction. There is a net release of total energy from the chemicals to the surroundings. The positive delta G is an endergonic reaction. There is a net intake of total energy from the surroundings to the chemicals. Now, if you're thinking that these definitions are sounding very similar to the definitions of exothermic and endothermic, you're correct. The differences between them are quite subtle, and an examiner might like to test your knowledge of this. So remember, exothermic and endothermic are referring to internal energy change only, whereas exergonic and endergonic refer to the total energy change. A useful memory tool for all of these terms uh, can be to say that in exothermic and exergonic processes, energy is exiting the chemicals, whereas in endothermic and endergonic processes, energy is entering from the surroundings. Now, once you've got a handle on what these terms mean and the relationships between them, there are all sorts of interesting things you can work out. For example, if you know the energy value associated with certain chemical bonds breaking and forming, then you can work out the delta H value of an organic reaction just by looking at the chemical structure of products and reactants. Also, if you know certain delta H and delta S values for a chemical reaction, you can work out the enthalpy change of the universe that happens when the reaction takes place. Imagine that. Um, however, so depending on what your course is, these may or may not be things that you're required to do. So in terms of giving you a grounding in the topic, we're not going any further. That's the end of the learning in this video. So I'll just leave you with a, a quick recap of the learning objectives, which I hope we've covered thoroughly. And apart from the brief quizzes that were uh, kind of scattered through the video workshop itself, there are plenty more practice problems for you to have a go at uh, to make sure you've understood the learning, which can be accessed using the links below the videos. Now, this video was recorded at the start of semester two. We are hoping to have some to be able to offer you some live workshop sessions this semester to uh, supplement the learning. So you should be able to come along to one of those to practice and get extra advice on this topic or any of the other topics that we've covered from uh, myself or Maria if necessary. If you're watching this after the workshops have been delivered or if we didn't get time to deliver any workshops, um, access copies of the practice questions and answers using the links provided and you're very welcome to email me and ask questions about any aspects of this video uh, if required. Okay, thank you very much for listening and best of luck with learning your thermodynamics.